Good morning, everybody. Uh, the topic of today's meeting uh, is the future of culture and creative industries in terms of the mega trends, the long term tendencies of uh, the industry and society and the underlying economy, of course. Uh, in a moment like this, speaking about the future of culture and creative industries is, of course, particularly delicate because the crisis that we are facing is going to influence in a substantial way in the long term and in terms of deep structural transformations not only the culture and creative industries but the whole culture and creative sectors and of course the economy as a whole and society as a whole so it's extremely difficult today to anticipate what will be the long-term trends nevertheless we can have today a first moment of reflection on how to speculate on the ongoing tendencies and in particular what will be the likely short and medium term adjustments and probably also a glance to the longer term uh, it's in particular important to understand that this kind of crisis is not simply a crisis in terms of uh, uh, managing a disruptive change that will uh, fall back to normal in more or less long times the point is that the new normal will be different from the old normal. It's very important so to understand that there are aspects of this change that are permanent, that will uh, be making a mark in a very radical and deep sense on the future of culture and creative production. So let's try to understand first what are the basic building blocks of the new situation and how they relate to the old situation. So first of all, one aspect that clearly is uh, becoming crucial and apparent in the new situation is the fact that limitations to physical circulation and social exchange are boosting digital access and uh, are giving to the digital dimension a relevance and a drive that although partially already anticipated and in the numbers of what was uh, the already ongoing tendency of development of cultural creative industries, today takes a completely different level. In particular, this means that uh, we cannot consider digital access as a complementary form of uh, access and experience, but more and more as the default form at, unless, until, the new situation will really allow a wide physical circulation and exchange of people. So for certain type of industries, this is no big deal. Uh, think for example of the video game industry that not uh, surprisingly is of course particularly thriving in the new situation. And clearly the online streaming of movies or music are uh, only boosted by the new situation again. But remaining to music, if you think, for example, uh, of uh, live concerts, the most industrial dimension of uh, the live performances, for example, or uh, the activity in uh, fields like, uh, for example, in creative sectors like uh, fashion or design, well, clearly these uh, physical limitations are uh, seriously compromising the function of the industry. Of course, it's disrupting uh, the fashion weeks, the, of course, the, the, the design uh, festivals, and of course, the same is true for uh, visual arts that uh, mostly are, of course, not part of the industrial component of uh, culture and creative production, but still are more and more deeply linked to it. And this just to make a few examples. So it's clear that, uh, on one side, there are, uh, let's say, natural winners and losers from the new situation in terms of uh, who is able to further develop their already existing business models with possibly even more opportunities and sectors that are uh, pushed dramatically in some cases to revise their organizational models, their business models to accommodate the new situation. Nevertheless, even for the sectors that are already naturally ingrained into the new situation because online access is already a prevalent or main mode 
of functioning for them. Also, these sectors will be affected. Uh, also, in view of the fact that, of course, the cultural and creative sectors are characterized today by a very complex web of structural interdependencies. Thinking of term in terms of a collection of sectors is in itself, in some sense, not completely correct. We should, uh, and uh, this is terminology is increasingly prevailing also in the literature and the public debate, we should think more of what we consider to be cultural ecosystems. So situations where the system of interdependencies or what happens in one specific production sector is uh, getting feedbacks, extremely complex feedbacks into other sectors and vice versa. So it's extremely important to get this systemic view. So uh, what kind of changes should we expect? So first of all, one aspect that uh, becomes uh, clearly a driving force in the new situation is that since people now have a prevalent mode of access through digital channels, what can you do? in terms of improving the quality of the experience through the digital channel. And this means in particular, revamping an interest towards techniques that so far have been of course developed, deployed to a certain extent, but that did not really get the center of the impetus so far in the industry development. I'm thinking for example of uh, enriched reality, augmented reality, and all forms that allow people to have from home or from remote a deep immersive capacity of experience of a certain situation. This is particularly true, for example, for museums. Museums experiment today a dramatic collapse of their audiences, their visitors, because uh, they're shut down, so it couldn't be otherwise. Nevertheless, as you, as you know, museums are today making an enormous effort to provide very high quality content online for virtual visits for the possibility of, for visitors to access very high quality reproduction nav navigable uh, formats to, to explore the collections. And this is of course something that reflects the current emergency, but also at the same, same time, develops a new possibility that would be absolutely absurd not to capitalize in the follow-up. So, for example, in the case of museums, developing, upgrading the level of uh, richness of the digital ex experience by making use also of uh, very innovative technologies that so far have been only to a limited extent deployed in this particular sectors uh, would probably be a natural consequence of what is happening. But if this is the case, of course, there is a very, very interesting possible strategic complementarity between museums and other sectors uh, of the cultural and creative industries. Because once you develop these powerful platforms and once you start to use these very complex technologies, as a consequence, immediately you think how you could enrich further the menu of content that you are providing. And this menu of content could clearly benefit from a co-production, for example, coming from the movie industry, coming from the video games industry, because another aspect we will see in a moment is gamification. We are probably going to experience a upsurge of the importance of gamification in these new forms of digital access. So the first important uh, dimension that we should consider is uh, the role of new emerging technologies in uh, enriching the experience uh, for uh, those parts of the culture and creative production sector where this digital uh, access is a real challenge because it entails a radical rethinking of the structure of uh, experience of supply of the sector itself. A second aspect that is uh, connected to this is, of course, the platform dimension itself. We know that uh, 
of course, the content industry that is related to culture and creative production is organizing itself in terms of a, what we could call a platform economy. We have a big, powerful platforms that are becoming hubs for this dissemination, distribution, and increasingly production of content that is being offered and in certain sectors is really completely restructuring the market. Think of what's happening today with Netflix in the case of movies and uh, TV series or Spotify as it comes to music. Um, these particular platforms, of course, have uh, special characteristics though. Think, for example, of Netflix. It clearly focuses on recent productions. It uh, considers in particular a catalog which is uh, probably more um, palatable, more attractive for the target viewers that they have, the, the most important market segments that they have. And as a consequence of this, as you can imagine, there is in the movie sectors a strong tendency to privilege uh, Hollywood commercial movies uh, although, for example, in the case of TV series, there is a very, very interesting attempt at uh, sampling and scanning quality production from all over the world, but again, with topics and targets that are clearly defined by their main audiences and uh, what are the main demand segments. Why I'm saying this? Because clearly, the logic of a content platform that is uh, private and of course uh, very industrial in its attitude is that of course it's profit oriented. So the structure of the content that is being put on the platform and also the logic of production of further content is strongly orientated towards uh, of course profit maximization. This is absolutely legitimate. There's nothing bad in it, but at the same time, it's also important to understand that uh, a full-fledged platform economy cannot limit itself to this. If we consider, for example, movies or even TV series, uh, it's extremely important and useful and probably also advantageous for the audiences themselves to consider alternative possibilities that were, for example, the historical backlog of movies, not only from the Hollywood catalog, more, but more generally, from the global repertoire of different local cinematographies could be made available to people. Probably this is not the kind of thing that an, an intrinsically commercial platform can be interested in doing, but this kind of content could be actually usefully deployed and could find their own audiences and could probably also lead to a more active and creative use of archives of content, which are huge and are, of course, present today, not only in uh, public institutions themselves, uh, like, for example, the national broadcasting companies and the archives of thereof, but also in some cases, also in private archives, private repositories that could be particularly interesting to make available to the public. Um, so, in this particular sense, we could imagine that from the point of view of a platform economy, there could be a space for new types of platforms that come not from the private, but from the public initiative. In some sense, we could see this as a natural uh, evolution of what is already being done with the Europeana. So creating a public repository of content that is made freely available for distribution and that uh, in this case, of course, uh, allows the dissemination of content that would be otherwise receive only very limited circulation. It's not necessarily true that uh, public platforms should uh, only deliver content that is uh, free access. We could even have uh, some kind of content that is paywalled, although probably with a relatively limited uh, cost, of course, of access. But it's extremely important to consider this because uh, in a situation where uh, this digital ecosystem is uh, shaping the future of production for the next few years, without a 
public strategy of cultural supply and deployment of content that is not of strict commercial interest according to the traditional logic of the existing platforms, we could really witness an impoverishment of the menus of uh, choice uh, for audiences and also, in some sense, also a cognitive uh, narrowing down of the focus of attention towards certain types of production. In a sense, we are already saying that um, these new platforms are, uh, could be part of uh, what is already thought to be a strategy, a massive strategy for the support on cultural and creative producers that uh, has to be absolutely put in place to avoid most of the professionals and small companies in the field to go out of business very quickly. So if there is a, a massive effort in terms of supporting the sectors and so a possibility of a huge amount of public spending that is devoted to this particular purpose, why not using part of this public spending, not simply in terms of direct transfers to compensate for income losses for producers, something that clearly is important, but also at the same time is absolutely short term and doesn't touch in any way the structural criticalities that are brought about by the new situation. Why not considering then the possibility of uh, designing new public platforms for content that could not antagonize what is happening today in the private sector, but rather complement it in very interesting ways. First of all, by providing content that is not the kind of content that is generally found on the commercial platforms, but also using this possibility to support producers and especially producers that in the new digital ecosystem that is being created would have a huge problems of delivering their content and in particular delivering their content in exchange of some remuneration whatsoever. So what is important in this sense is to imagine public platforms that could become hubs of distribution of content and at the same time secure a fair remuneration to the culture and creative professionals and companies that would deliver their content. As you know, for example, in the current crisis, there has been a very generous attempt by countless producers to put their own content for free available for people locked down uh, into their, uh, their homes and uh, so unable to access culture through the more familiar ways. And this has been, of course, a very important sign of vitality and the promptness of the system, the cultural creative system to react to the new situation. Nevertheless, we also realize very quickly that this is not viable in the long term. I mean, uh, providing this for free basically means that uh, professionals that very often have very tight budget constraints in terms of financial viability of their activity would be put in the impossibility to go on with their professional activity in the field. So the public platform from this point of view could become an extremely interesting new device to secure new forms of viable activity for producers, especially keeping in mind that the culture and creative sectors, unlike most of the production sectors, have the characteristic of being extremely proviscular. These are sectors in which micro companies and single freelancers are dominating in terms of the quantitative distribution the actual composition of the sectors. And this means that in particular, these players are extremely fragile from the point of view of their dependency on day-to-day uh, -day income streams. And of course, on top of that, these are also producers that have very limited access to credit because of course, the logic of a credit uh, is uh, privileging, uh, uh, of course, lenders, uh, uh, sorry, borrowers that have uh, uh, much more solid uh, financial re requirements in terms of uh, assets and guarantees. So, as a matter of fact, 
the idea of developing a public platform economy in the cultural and creative sector could on one side become a very strong way to support cultural producers, but also on the other side could also become an extremely interesting uh, laboratory for innovation. For uh, we know already that of course the commercial platforms and more generally the commercial, the more commercial side of cultural and creative industry has relatively little interest in radical experimentation. Experimentation, of course, is something that is uh, costly and at the same time very uncertain and uh, produces most of the time controversial results. So, of course, in a purely commercial logic, investing in uh, radical experimentation is probably pointless. But the point is that without radical experimentation, there would be no evolution whatsoever of the content industry because of course today for us is natural but if you understand that uh, let's say what has been the role of experimental music uh, let's say in, uh, film scores or what has been the role of uh, conceptual and visual arts uh, the most experimental part of them in advertising on in uh, of course in their recent cinematography well this is so apparent that it barely needs any comment so as a consequence, uh, the importance of keeping on experimenting is crucial. And um, in particular, public digital platforms could really become places where uh, basic experimentation is carried out. And uh, this uh, resonates with the idea put forward by Mariana Mazzucato in her uh, uh, famous book, The Entrepreneurial State, where she claims that uh, it's uh, mostly public money that has been responsible for big technological pushes because of course uh, it's this kind of public money that can be spent uh, without having an immediate return in terms of uh, effectiveness of the experimentation for the development of new uh, techn viable technologies or commercial products and so the crucial role of public money in uh, driving radical experimentation and innovation is uh, has been uh, very much underplayed, but uh, it's apparent today, and in particular in the sectors of the cultural and creative industry, could, this could really make a big difference. Another aspect of uh, a model of a public platform that should be worth uh, thinking about is the fact that today the regulation, of course, of the platform economy as an entirely private one is very problematic. We know in particular how complex it is, especially in terms of the platforms that generate lots of user-generated content and more generally platforms that monitor and scan the actual use of the platform made by users. Of course, this generates lots of uh, data that are in many cases sensitive data and that are of course an enormous commercial value. The entrance of uh, public players into the platform economy would probably also contribute to a stronger and more effective regulation of the ecosystem itself. And this is again something that is very important to consider. Another aspect that I already anticipated a bit is the increasing role that gamification is probably playing in this particular industry. Because uh, clearly, when we start uh, thinking of uh, a platform economy, a digital platform economy, as the future next scenario, we also have to understand that the platform economy is not simply a one-sided way of broadcasting and communicating content, but offers countless possibilities for collaborative production of content, extremely interactive production of content. And this means that in particular, uh, what was previously thought of as the audience can be engaged into uh, producing uh, collaboratively content or also pursuing some particular uh, tasks and goals in ways that can be particularly interesting for the public interest. So we can imagine, for example, that uh, gamification can play an extremely important role, for example, in uh, creating different possible uses of uh, cultural and creative content. Just to make uh, an example, uh, a situation that uh, is today already quickly developing is the use of culture and creative content, for example, in therapeutic strategies. There, are, there is already a strong stream of literature, for example, in uh, designing video games 
for people with cognitive impairments for, or uh, more specifically neurodegenerative diseases like the Alzheimer's disease. Um, when we consider in particular a digital platform economy, we can imagine that the delivery of this kind of content, for example, to people who have uh, particular illnesses or are in the middle of a certain therapeutic paths can be particularly important. Think, for example, of, and I am speaking about something that is already being experimented today, uh, delivering culture and creative content, for example, to children in oncological departments. So situations where you have a very serious health conditions and where children experiment a very high level of personal suffering. For example, today, it has been already experimented that uh, using gamification in a smart way to produce creative content for children to better understand their therapeutic strategies and uh, to participate in the therapy as part of a more uh, of a wider digital experience which also has entertainment and engagement dimensions is of course extremely uh, relieving the, the the pain the burden for children to undergo this kind of traumatic experience and this is just an example can you imagine more generally how gamification in a digital platform economy can help us coordinate in a variety of possible dimensions, which of course have to do with health and well-being, but which could also have to do with the provision of public services, could also have to do with education. So just to make a few examples, it's clear that the gamification dimension, and in particular how we can uh, engage people in ways in which their incentive structure is peaked by uh, the particular kind of experience menu that we propose in ways that uh, enable people to participate actively while enjoying the experience through the particular engagement mechanisms that are made possible by gamification structures when well designed is again something that we should consider with extreme attention. And more generally, and uh, on the way of closing this uh, intervention, this reflection, it's important to understand that this digital dimension is probably also giving a new boost to the more general idea of uh, culture as a very, very important source of social impact and behavioral change. So through the cultural uh, experience we know historically that people have experienced very strong emotional reactions very strong cognitive reactions behavioral change that ensues from this is of course uh, something that is not surprising is part of the very notion of what culture was especially in its more grassroots dimensions at the dawn of the, the modern uh, uh, cultural production uh, but uh, in particular in the case of digital interfaces we have really a new possibility to work uh, in ways that for example can uh, uh, be part of a wide-ranging long-term strategies that have to do with for example promoting and defending the psychological well-being of people or defending social or promoting social cohesion we know what kind of disruptive effects the lockdown is provoking, both on the mental health of people and also the kind of strain on social relationships that is being created by the fact that physical contact that for humans is a, such an important component of social life is today so seriously prejudicated. So it's extremely important, for example, to consider culture and creative industry not only as a source of content, with of course uh, commercial potential and as we have seen also not necessarily only strictly commercial potential but uh, also as a very very important source of meaning for people uh, a source of uh, experiences that can structure the everyday perception and emo emotional balance cognitive balance of people and preserve some of the aspects of social quality and human development that are so important for us. So in this particular sense, the digital uh, transition that we are experimenting also opens up new possibilities, new ways for culture and creative industries, which could also, of course, become new market opportunities, 
new opportunities for professional development, for the creation of new professional figures. And this should be absolutely not disregarded because this is really probably one of the most innovative and I should say even fulfilling directions in which culture and creative production could develop itself, turning at least part of this big social tragedy into an opportunity for development and for innovation. So uh, it's uh, our 30 minutes are up. So thank you very much for your kind attention and look forward to discussing with you directly during the seminar. Thank you very much.